Welcome in this morning. Great to be with you on a Tuesday after the long weekend. I'm guessing most of you are probably back to work by now, and we appreciate everything you do. Thank you for joining us on the program. You're listening to Tactics. As always, I'm Caleb Cockwood. I may have a different name one day, but right now it's Caleb Cockwood right here with you for Tactics on News Radio 1440. Now, yesterday, and you know those days, I tell you what, we'll just start with this. You know how sometimes when you have a vacation from work and you come back and you feel like the entire world's just falling apart without you? That's kind of what it feels like today because took yesterday off, took Martin Luther King Day off, and, uh, you know, it just the whole world seems like it's gone absolutely crazy. The Internet is abuzz with many problems, and we're going to get to those, but I do think it's important that we start out right here in our own community with people that are facing real problems. And I thought about how to do this story, but the more and more I looked into it, the more and more I thought about it, the more I really came to the realization that this is a story that ought to be celebrated. This is a story that really we should be grateful for what's going on. Uh, hold on just a second. Something weird is going on with my background. Let me see if I can fix that just one second here. Yeah, that ought to do it. You never know what's going to happen on a live web show. That just, you know, sometimes that's the uh, that's the card you draw. But anyway, so yesterday there was something really big happening right in our little area here around Montgomery, and Wetumpka was at the epicenter of it. Unfortunately, there was a a tornado that hit that community pretty badly, and it affected Wetumpka, of course, and it actually affected quite a few other places sort of around there. And uh, I know that one in particular, that a part of the community that was hit pretty hard was right there around the bridge, the really famous iconic area. Uh, some people refer to it as Church Row. And so really, really unfortunate that that was going on there. Really hate to see some of the historic buildings there get hit and some of the people who had homes around there. Uh, getting affected. One thing that I also wanted to point out too, and I thought that uh, this was significant, is that if you're looking at the uh, area even around Wetumpka, it didn't just affect the people in the actual city limits of Wetumpka. The entire uh, part, uh, an entire big chunk of Elmore County was without internet for a while. And I know that that's just a minor inconvenience compared to the destruction. Just saying that this really had impacts on people that may not have even known what was going on in Wetumpka until hours later. And at my ho house, for example, I think it was like late Sunday night before Internet finally came back on. So uh, just to give you sort of an idea of how deep the destruction is, is that even the areas that weren't actually hit by the tornado, because I'm 20 miles away from Wetumpka easily, and you were seeing homes outside of that area even affected by some of the, the devastation. But the uh, National Weather Service reported that it was an EF2 tornado that hit on Saturday with winds up to 130 miles an hour. So really devastating s storm. And Mayor Jerry Willis talked about several homes being lost, especially some of the homes in the historic district there. So it is really unfortunate to see what was going on there. And I did want to show you a couple of the pictures of some of the places that were hit the hardest. First of all, let's go ahead and look here. You can see right there that there is this just really huge building that has been devastated and taken down. I think that may actually be the senior center because I know they talked about that being destroyed. So this is a pretty big building, and I mean, it's just completely leveled. There's there's no salvaging any of that. Here's another one, and uh, there wasn't a ton of damage sustained to the Wetumpka Police Department, but... Uh, some of the cars, as you can see there, were were hit pretty hard. In this particular one, it looks like a tree fell through it or something. So one of the cruisers was completely banged up. And the station itself, the police station, actually did see a little bit of uh, damage there. Let's also look. Uh, oh, this is First Baptist in Wetumpka. And you can see that the steeple is gone. And the building over there to the side of it, I think that's actually part of the same building. Or maybe it's an annex of the building. But its roof has been completely demolished, and, and you'll see that that steeple is no longer on there on First Baptist. So that church going through quite a lot. But finally, and this was the really big one that I wanted to show you, um, you can actually see that there is this just huge building 
that has been leveled. And what you're seeing right there is First Presbyterian Church. And for those of you who have been in the Wetumpka area and know it, First Presbyterian is this gorgeous old church building, or was, that sits there. And one of the people that were was being interviewed for this remarked that it's probably the single most painted object in the city of Wetumpka other than the bridge. They're saying building-wise, it's probably the most painted object. And the reason for that is because it is in the background of that iconic Wetumpka Bridge. And this is a church that was 163 years old. Just to give you sort of an idea of how old this church is, they have a slave balcony. This thing was built before the Civil War, where there were still slaves. And so you can tell very quickly that this is the reason that you're seeing all this death and destruction and devastation going on here, that you can tell that uh, this tornado that just absolutely demolished and destroyed this, this particular church that was, had been there forever, 163 years old. I mean, it's just, it's heartbreaking to think that that's what this congregation was going through. If you were somebody who worshiped at a church building, whether it was 163 years old or not. I mean, our building over at Dalreda is maybe a decade or more old. Uh, it's, it's not very old at all. We, we have a, a pretty new building. And I got to tell you, if that thing was destroyed, it would, be a, it would be like a big part of my life was gone. Now, the congregation would still be there, obviously. My church brothers and sisters would still be there, and that's the important thing. But I mean, just imagining... The building being gone, I guess we just have to disperse into some of the other congregations in the city for a little while until we got a chance to build it back up. And it just really, I can't imagine what it would be like to have the place where we all get together and meet and, and talk about talk about the Lord and talk to one another and try to admonish and, and help one another and edify one another. That just being gone, I mean, in the blink of an eye, no preparation, anything. Just having that ripped away from you, I can't imagine what that's like. But nonetheless, that is what that congregation is going through right now. But I want to show uh, real quick a clip of the one of the ministers. Uh, I believe he's the minister over there. A guy named um, Yo or Jonathan Yarborough, and he goes out there looking for his base and all the rubble, and and miraculously he finds it. So here's a clip from some local. Uh, news coverage up in Birmingham. It happened 24 hours later. Um, there would have been catastrophic uh, loss of life. Because the pastor's church was leveled. This was First Presbyterian in Wetumpka, a more than 150 year old church destroyed by a possible tornado. All right. Woo. God is good all the time. The pastor was reunited with that longtime friend. Bertha and I have been together for a very long time. Finding a way through the destruction to find a message in the music. Maybe this is a testament to God's sense of humor and spirit that uh, all will be made well. Now, you gotta love the guy's attitude. You gotta love the way that he reacts to it. You'll, you'll see in the first part of that clip that he was saying, well, if this had happened 24 hours later, look how bad that would have been. There would have been devastating loss of life. You know what? He's probably right. Can you imagine if the tornado hit a po populated place like that, a building with, I don't know how many this particular church held, but even if it's just 50, I mean, you're talking about going from a situation where nobody died to a situation where 50 people probably would have died because that building was just gone. And the idea that somebody would have survived that, uh, it's possible, but not likely. And so if this had happened 24 hours later, he's right. There probably would have been a devastating loss of life. And so I really do appreciate his attitude that he's thinking, hey, this could have been a hundred times worse. This is a guy that works at the church and just lost his place of work and the, his place of worship all at the same time. And he's looking at it and saying, Hey, th this could have been a lot worse. L look at how fortunate we are that this did not happen when there was anybody in the building. So I just, I love his attitude about it. And one thing that he talks about 
or one thing that you'll see when he's pulling his base out of the rubble, which uh, somehow his base not only survived, it doesn't have a scratch on it. That's how he described it. I mean, it, it's in good working order. It's not busted up or anything. Somehow, despite all of that, his base is fine. And that really is just astounding to me. But one of the things that he brings up is that God is good all the time. When he's coming out of the rubble, when he's coming out of that destruction and finds his base, he comments with, God is good all the time. And I think too often we reserve our praise for God when something that we approve of happens. In other words, we see it as a fortunate situation, or we see it as something that is good that happened for us, and we'll say, well, God is good. Now, is that true? Absolutely it's true. Am I saying that people ought not do that? No, no, no. I'm, I'm not suggesting that at all. I'm just saying that sometimes we take the, the mindset that God is good when good things happen to us. And here's a guy probably disagree with him on a lot of issues when it comes to doctrine and faith, but he has the right attitude here. He's coming out of this destruction, coming out of having just lost the church building. You know, the church is the people, obviously, but the church building. And he's walking out of there saying God is good all the time. Because God is good whether or not things that are favorable to us happen. You can look all through the biblical narrative and see the example after example after example after example of terrible things, really horrible things by the world standards, happening to God's people. And yet, there is a common theme throughout all of that that if you do have faith in God and you do believe that everything is going to work out to the good of those who love him, which, by the way, Romans 8.28 that if you believe that, you're going to remark that God is good even when terrible things happen to him. And, and I got to say, this does remind me of Job. That you remember when all these just horrific things were happening to Job. And I mean really terrible things. Losing his house, losing his fortune, losing his her herds, and losing his own children. All in the same day. All ten of them. And his wife starts nagging him and talking about how horrible this whole thing is, and he responds with, are we supposed to accept God's blessings and not accept the terrible times that happen as well? Are we supposed to praise God when he gives us what we want and curse him when he doesn't? And that's really sort of the attitude that I think is being adopted here. That, yeah, it's an unfortunate situation that we find ourselves in, but the idea that God is not good or that this is something that should we should blame him on, or that we should even halt in our praise toward him because there's a situation that we don't like taking place, is simply not a Christian way to look at it. And I think that this guy has the right attitude. I appreciate that. So uh, kudos to you, Minister Jonathan Yarborough. And I still think that it was nothing short of providence that nobody died. We had one injury. Think about that. Twelve houses damaged, a church completely demolished, another church, heavy damage, police station taking heavy damage. And yet, well, I think the police station took light damage, but anyway, you think about all that. And yet, one person injured, no deaths. i got to believe that's got to be Providence. I'm sorry, I just do. And I can't say that for sure. I can't point to it and say I know for a fact this was providence, but it seems that way to me. That this thing just happened to hit in exactly the right way to where nobody was really, uh, the, nobody was killed and only one person was injured. And so that is something to give praise to God about. Because as horrible as it is to lose the buildings and as horrible as this destruction is, look, buildings can be rebuilt. And I know it, it sucks to lose them, but buildings can be rebuilt. People can't. And so if you think about it, this would be at best considered minimal losses when you're considering the things that are really important. Well, despite that incredibly uplifting story, I, I really need to compare and contrast two stories that I think you have sort of dueling sides of. And over this weekend, you may have noticed, and I didn't really get a chance to cover this while it was happening because... 
I started my show right about the time the festivities started. And of course, I'm talking about what happened in D.C. this weekend, the March for Life. Now, the March for Life, which has been happening virtually since the beginning of the decision Roe versus Wade, has grown and grown every year. They had a substantial crowd this year. They said one of the biggest ones that there has ever been in the media, of course, basically acted like it didn't happen. You'll notice that every time that there is a a media or an event, a protest that the media agrees with, that what they'll usually do is they'll inflate the numbers or they'll just show these gigantic sweeping shots of people and have them close and, and dialed in so that the crowds look really huge and really dense. And typically, and sometimes that's true, sometimes the numbers really are big. But my point is, I know as somebody that's worked in media and somebody that knows how to angle a camera and work a camera, that you can tell by some of the coverage that they're intentionally trying to make that crowd look a lot bigger than it actually is. And they'll basically ignore things like the March for Life. This has become fairly standard fare for them. And I watch significant chunks of both. And what you will notice is that there is a very stark contrast between the mood and the rhetoric and the mentality of the people that are there. And I wanted to point to this for one. One was laser focused on one issue, and that was abortion. At the March for Life, all the speakers were talking specifically about abortion. They didn't really deviate into other issues. Even when they did talk about political things, for example, you had Mike Pence speaking for a little while. I think he actually called in by phone, so he wasn't physically there. But you had different speakers, and they all centered around the issue of abortion. And so they do a really good job, I think, of laser focusing in on that. Sometimes the Tea Party movement, as great as they are, and, and I'm a supporter of that and you know that, sometimes the Tea Party movement, I think, deviated a little too much from its core mission of talking about taxes and the fact that we're, we're spending too much, that kind of thing. And because of that, it wound up losing its way a little bit, especially there towards the end, because they delved out, they sort of spilled out into so many different issues. Sometimes the NRA, even though I think usually they, they keep a pretty tight laser focus on the Second Amendment, you'll occasionally see the NRA delve into uh, a couple of other issues. I think they do a pretty good job of keeping it tight, but sometimes you, you will see them, unfortunately, um, go off into other issues. Not that the issues are wrong, or I think their stance on it is wrong, just that you really have to be laser focused on that one issue if you're going to be an advocacy group or an advocacy event for a particular issue. And the March of Life did a really good job of that. The March of Life did an excellent job of making sure that the speakers and the people that were presenting there were all dialed in on the issue of abortion. When you talk about the Women's March, which happened a day later, they were sort of all over the place. I would also like to point to the significance of the days being different because you had more people at the March for Life and you need to consider that when you're talking about the March for Life, this happens on a Friday. So not exactly the middle of the week, but you're talking about people mostly that had to take off work or school to be able to get up to the March for Life. The Women's March happened on Saturday it's a lot easier to get a group of people on Saturday, and yet the March for Life still was larger than the Women's March. And you're seeing this contrast, and the media doesn't like reporting it or doesn't like talking about it, despite the fact that that was exactly what was going on. So the uh, Washington Post, talking about the partisanship or, or being dialed into that one issue, the Washington Post gave the March for Life an awful lot of flack because Ben Shapiro was one of the invited speakers. And if you are someone who watches the Ben Shapiro show, you'll know um, that he does, because it, of course, appears on, on this fine station, News Radio 1440 at 3 o'clock every afternoon. But when it comes to Ben Shapiro's show, it's also a video podcast, kind of like mine, actually. Different format to a degree, but, you know, more or less the same venue. And what Ben does is he has that earlier in the day and then records segments of it for radio and then puts it on our station and other stations in the Westwood One Cumulus family throughout the rest of the day. And so Ben Shapiro's show actually happened, if you were listening to it Friday on News Radio 1440, happened at the March for Life. And 
he was doing this whole live thing and, and because he was one of the prominent speakers there, because he is a outspoken advocate for life, March for Life invited him down there and the Washington Post tried to go after go after the March for Life because they had done this and they said, well, this is proof that it's just become a political thing. Well, it was always a political thing. And they're saying, well, it's just you know partisan and it's not really focused on the issue. Here's the thing about that. First of all, Ben Shapiro spent literally his entire show talking about one issue, which he has never done before because he wanted to make sure that it was all laser focused on the issue of abortion. And they completely ignored that. And another thing, too, that is important to, for you to note here, it's true now that abortion has become essentially a partisan issue, but it wasn't always that way. It became a partisan issue when the Democrat Party said that you can't be pro-life and be a Democrat. We won't fund you. Now, they've since backed off on that stance. But you can see the actual DNC saying that if you are pro-life, you are not a Democrat. If you're pro-life, you cannot be a part of our party. And you're saying that Republicans are the ones that have partisanized the issue of abortion? No, 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 no. The Democrats are the ones that are saying, unless you agree with us on this position, you're out. And so let's not try to make this about parties when you're saying that it's the Republicans and the people in charge of the March for Life that are making this a partisan thing, when clearly it's the Democrats that are the ones that have made this into a party issue. The Republicans tend to lean more pro-life on that, but the pro-life movement is far bigger than the Republican Party. If the Republican Party ceased to exist, I'm not a member of the Republican Party, and I'm an incredibly outspoken advocate for life. And so you're, you're the ones that are trying to actually turn this into something that divides us. Governor Andrew Cuomo this is a quote from just, I think, last year. Are these extreme conservatives who are right, right to life, pro-assault weapon, anti-gay? Is that who they are? Because if that's who they are, then they're extreme conservatives and they have no place in the state of New York because that's not who New Yorkers are. Now, I want you to think about that. That is not the mayor of New York City even. That is the governor of a state who is saying that if you are pro-life, you are not welcome in this state. Get out of our state. That's not who New Yorkers are. We don't want you here. But the March for Life people, they're the ones that have turned it into a partisan issue. Okay. Let's be honest about how this became a party line issue. And then maybe we can have a conversation about the March for Life people trying to partisanize the issue of life. And another thing that you'll notice in contrast of these two marches, one was filled with prayer and scripture, and the other mostly just paid lip service to it. Because I'm looking back and forth at this thing, and you saw that the March for Life was very much God-centered, and even though they made arguments based on science, based on biology, based on policy, they made all of those arguments. But... There was also a, a somberness, a sense of prayerfulness that took place at that march. And I'm sure that there were people that are not necessarily believers or not very strong in their faith. But one thing that I thought they conveyed and came across pretty well is that they noted that God is really at the center of this because, as Ben Shapiro explained in his own show, the right to life the idea that a human being is intrinsically valuable because it is created in the image of God, that is a religious-based stance. Now, it doesn't mean that the only way you can get to a pro-life stance is to believe in God. There's actually a myriad of different ways to be able to do that. But the idea that you as a human are valuable, you pretty much have to use God to get there. Because if not, we all, all are just a clump of cells. Adults, I mean, able-bodied people, whoever it is, every human being is insignificant and merely a collection of atoms in this large, vast, overspent universe if there is no God. But the idea that human life by itself is valuable because it contains a spark of the divine, that is an argument that is rooted 
in the idea that human beings are created by God and that there is a creator with a purpose for them that loves them. And because of that, we need to treat other people as though they are valuable because they share a kinship with the Almighty. And so that is an argument that is based in faith. And then the other one basically just paid lip service to it. And if there was a running theme in the Women's March, it's that you can do whatever the heck you want to when it comes to uh, debauchery, sex, doesn't matter. You do whatever you want to, doesn't matter. We're not going to be held accountable to this stuff. And even when they tried to evoke religion, they basically wanted to drag it out of the closet when they thought it kind of might kind of make a point for them and then throw it right back in. Because one of the overarching themes of the scripture is that God loves you too much to leave you to your own devices. If God didn't care what we did as human beings, then there would be no Bible in the first place. God would never tell us that we were doing things wrong, that we were making mistakes, and that we needed to do better. That's the whole point of the scripture. That's the whole point of divine revelation, is that God is looking at his creation, looking at mankind and saying, this is not what I created you for. This is not the reason that I put you on this earth. This is not the way you're supposed to be treating your fellow brothers and sisters. That's the reason we have the Bible in the first place, is to show us where we're messing up and where we can do better. And to reveal God to us in such a way that we can come to love him and to love our neighbors as ourselves. That's really the theme of the whole scripture. And yet, at the other march, at the women's march, you were seeing people basically saying, ah, do whatever you want. God doesn't really care. You can do whatever you want. For example, there was this one woman in particular that, and, and we'll get to her a little bit later as well, but she was coming out and talking about how our enemy is transphobia and homophobia and xenophobia and all these other things, which xenophobia actually is a bad thing, but it's like racism, it's applied to people that aren't actually xenophobic all the time, but nonetheless. And I was just sitting there thinking like, and, and she also said in this same speech that you can be, you can be Muslim, you can be Jewish, you can be whatever you want to, and, and we're all going to be okay in God's sight and we're all going to wind up being saved anyway. And I'm just sitting there thinking that that's nowhere in the Bible. That's nowhere in any religious text. I mean, even if it's religions that I don't agree with, they don't claim that you can get to God however you want to. I mean, the Muslim faith, for example, I don't believe a word of it. But it is saying that unless you worship Allah and him alone and don't think of Jesus as the Messiah, then you're not going to get to go to heaven. And so there, there's no religion in the world that does not teach exclusivity. I mean, not a serious one. I think Scientology has something about that, but I mean, come on, let's be honest about that. Uh, but if you're looking at religions, they all assume that they're right or else they wouldn't be distinct from the other religions in the first place. If you believe that X religion is correct, you wouldn't invent a new religion or you wouldn't come up with a different set of ideas to guide yourself. That doesn't make any sense. And so this whole multiculturalism thing just kind of falls on its face. And so you saw one side actually being in a prayerful mood and one side just occasionally paying lip service to it and not even often when it comes to that. And another one that I noticed is if you're looking at some of the speakers, and this is where my fancy degree as a communication person at Auburn does come in handy you saw that one side used what's known as a logos argument. When you're looking at the March for Life, virtually everything that was said there had to do with logic and reason. That was the goal. That was, some of the, what, that was one of the intended themes of the entire day, is that when you were talking about making these arguments for why the unborn ought to be protected, it was all logic-based arguments. I mean, there was a draw to emotion occasionally, but you were mostly staying in the realm of, okay, when does the baby's heartbeat start? When does the nervous system start to develop? When do you have digits that are distinct from one another? All of these things. And then you go to the Women's March. Guys, it was nothing but feelings. It was nothing but we feel upset and we feel oppressed. Therefore, our actions are justified. Therefore, we need to do this or we need to do that. I mean, there, was there were virtually no logic-based arguments whatsoever 
in the woman's March, or at least none in the, in the segments that I saw. Maybe there was another one in a part that I didn't see, but I'm telling you, I was looking through uh, a lot of content on that. And all I saw were a bunch of women making feelings based arguments. And I just did not see much logical appeal there. So there was a controversy that grew out of this whole thing. And it was Ben Shapiro uh, and the, the, these two things were trending on Twitter, Ben Shapiro and baby Hitler. And in case you were wondering why that was going on, there was a controversial segment and I'm using air fingers quote there. Cause I saw the whole thing. I didn't think it was controversial at the time. And then I saw that people were saying it was controversial later. And I still didn't understand exactly what they were saying was controversial, but I'll let you be the judge of that. We're going to go ahead and look at this comment from the Ben Shapiro show live from the March for Life. Finally, argument number 10. This one has become popular in recent years after the book Freakonomics came out. That argument is that abortion lowers the crime rate, right? That all the, that, that what has lowered the crime rate traditionally has been killing all the would-be criminals. First of all, okay, that I, I don't know who's comfortable with the pre-crime version of humanity, where we get to decide before you're born whether you're likely to be a criminal and then abort you based on future criminal activity in which you have not participated. Right? The, the, the argument, I guess, here is that would you kill baby Hitler? And the truth is that no pro-life person on earth would kill baby Hitler, right? Because baby Hitler wasn't Hitler. Adult Hitler was Hitler. Baby Hitler was a baby. Right? What you presumably want to do with baby Hitler was take baby Hitler out of baby Hitler's house and move baby Hitler into a better house where he would not grow up to be Hitler, right? That's the idea. <laughs> But it is also true that the crime statistics do not even match up. Criminologist Barry Latzer points out that abortions became available in 1973 under Roe versus Wade. Those young people would go on to create a massive crime spike and the crack cocaine epidemic. But if you move forward 15 to 20 years, right, which, that's when you would see the crime drop due to the abortion of babies. But there is no crime drop. You'd expect the absent babies, right, the babies that were killed starting in 1973, not to be around carjacking people. But it turns out that people were still carjacking people 15 years after Roe v. Wade, 20 years after Roe v. Wade. The crime, the crime spike only began to drop in 1994, a solid 21 years after Roe v. Wade was actually put in place. That can't be due to abortion, right? That's really due to additional policing, so it doesn't even match up statistically. Okay, now, in all of this discussion, I've refrained from discussing the Bible and religion. Now, one of the arguments that I've made is based on the Bible or religion. Now, the media will pretend that I didn't make any of these arguments, that it's all about the Bible and religion because the left prefers to believe that religion is stupid and people who believe in religion are stupid, people who believe in God are idiots, and that's the reason why we prefer to, to protect the lives of the unborn. But we do have to recognize one religious root to every argument that I'm making, and that is the innate value of human life. That is a religiously based argument. All right, so there you see Ben Shapiro, and that was the thing that was controversial, is they were essentially saying that Ben Shapiro was showing that he would have supported Hitler because of that comment that he's saying, because you would not kill baby Hitler, a pro-life person would not have aborted baby Hitler. Then they're saying that, well, Ben Shapiro must like Hitler and be a fan of Hitler. The guy's name is Shapiro. He's Jewish. The, the idea that somehow Ben Shapiro is a Nazi sympathizer and a white supremacist, despite the fact that not only is he Jewish, Back in the 2016 election, there was actually a study done about anti-Semitism and journalists and other people, public figures in the media that were receiving death threats and anti-Semitic slurs and that kind of thing. Ben Shapiro was the number one media personality, the number one media personality when it came to receiving the most anti-Semitic slurs and death threats. And somehow this guy is a Nazi sympathizer. That's not the point that he's making. He's saying that no matter how horrible the human being is, you don't punish them before they've done whatever it is that they, you think that they're going to do because you don't know. And he's saying, even if you had hindsight and knew that the baby actually was going to do evil things, you still wouldn't kill the child because at that point, the child is innocent. That's the point that he's making. And unfortunately, you, uh, even though he makes these excellent points, lots of logic-based arguments, uh, and just absolutely smashes a lot of these narratives, they act as though the only thing that he said was baby Hitler, and baby Hitler is the thing that they want to zero in on and focus on. And so that kind of goes to the next clip that we're going to play about the, uh, the Young Turks 
tried to categorize and sort of um, misconstrue the argument that Ben was making in this way. So take a look. If you extend this ridiculous, uh, obviously ridiculous hypothetical, you could play it the other way, which is, okay, so if you knew the baby that was, go that was just conceived an hour ago, uh, if you knew that that child, uh, when after birth, was going to grow up to be Hitler, would you terminate that presidency? So you're telling, uh, 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 pregnancy. Uh, pregnancy, thank you. Uh, you're telling me then that you are okay with the, the slaughter of six million people. In other words, it's, it's a ridiculous plank to get out on to begin with because it, it can have only one answer. All right. Now, I chose this particular clip because, frankly, it's the only thing somewhat somewhat uh, like an argument. I mean, I watched this uh, five or six minute clip on the Young Turks, and it is nothing but mindless drivel and ad hominem attacks. That was the closest thing to an actual argument addressing this particular clip that I could find. You've got maybe 25 seconds of someone trying to form a coherent logical argument. But the funny thing is, is he's saying, well, the premise of would you kill baby Hitler is ridiculous. Yes, that's Ben Shapiro's point. He's saying that it is ridiculous. He's saying that it doesn't make any sense. He's saying that you wouldn't kill somebody before they've committed a heinous crime like this. That's his whole point. It is ridiculous to hold somebody to a standard and hold someone accountable for crimes they've yet to commit. And that's why he's saying the argument that is pro-abortion that, well, if you're aborting children, these are mostly going to be children in poor communities and, and women that don't have a choice. And so because of that, you're going to be eliminating all the criminals. He's saying that argument is stupid and it's just as ridiculous as the scenario, would you kill baby Hitler? You saw the clip. You saw what Ben Shapiro said in context. And now compare that and look at that and compare that to what the guy at the Young Turks just said. I mean, there's you can see that he's actually kind of making Ben Shapiro's point for him. And then what's hilarious about that is he says, oh, that's terribly ridiculous. And then also says in that same clip, but if you wouldn't, if you wouldn't abort Hitler, then that means that you're fine with 6 million people getting slaughtered. No, that's not what he's saying at all. He's saying that you don't punish people for a crime they've yet to commit. And so it's funny that he says, well, the argument in the scenario is ridiculous and then kind of takes the opposite stance on it and says, but if given the opportunity, I would of course abort Hitler. He's saying, you're telling me that if you wouldn't abort that child, you wouldn't terminate that pregnancy, whatever, you know, moniker you want to use for it then you're okay with 6 million people getting killed. No, again, Ben Shapiro's Jewish. The Holocaust was a horrible thing. The point that he's saying is a pro-life person doesn't want children to be slaughtered before they've ever committed a crime or hold them guilty or use the argument that, well, they're just going to grow up to be a criminal anyway, so we might as well go ahead and off them. No, that's not what that means. I mean, if that's the case then children that don't have both parents in the home, they're far more likely to commit crimes. Do we go into the poor neighborhoods and go into the homes of people that only have one parent and just kill them because they're statistically more likely? So what he's saying is even if you take that ridiculous premise that you kill people beforehand, before they've committed a crime to its logical conclusion, then wouldn't you have to just kill the people that are likely to commit crimes, whether they're children or not. You ever seen Captain America um, Winter Soldier? It's the second Captain America movie. That's what S.H.I.E.L.D. was doing. They took this algorithm and they looked at the probability of people committing crimes. And they said, okay, these are the people that are likely to commit crimes. So what we're going to do is we're going to purge the earth and take out the people that we think will probably commit crimes in the future. That's insane. And that was the whole premise of this dystopian science fiction movie that we're going to take people out before they even commit a crime. And of course it was ridiculous and of course it was stupid. And that's Ben Shapiro's point. That's the point of the pro-life movement is you don't make arguments based on what a person might theoretically do in the future. And that's why you don't use that as a justification to snuff out somebody's life. And it just... 
astounds me that this guy actually winds up making the argument in favor of killing baby Hitler directly after saying how ridiculous and stupid a scenario that that is. But I guess that's, uh, that's just par for the course when it comes to this stuff. But here's the thing. If you're looking at these two movements, I, I want to make a stark contrast here because we had the March for Life Friday, we had the Women's March Saturday, and then we had Martin Luther King Day on Monday. And I think that you can kind of tie all these events together. There was one woman speaker, and you've already heard me mention her earlier. She was the one that was talking about how basically you can use anybody to get to heaven. You can be Muslim and go to heaven. You can be Jewish and go to heaven, which according to all of those religions' own doctrines is not true. And it's especially true in Christianity, where in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. In other words, if Jesus isn't the Savior, if Jesus isn't God, if you're not following his doctrines, sorry, you're not getting into heaven. That's the way that this works. That's consistent throughout all of the New Testament. And yet, she was saying this, and so the same woman starts talking about Martin Luther King Jr., and proceeded to advocate for a whole bunch of things that he would have never stood for. So in the same paragraph of her speech, where she was talking about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., she also talks about it's so horrible that people are transphobic and homophobic and all this sort of stuff. I don't really even necessarily agree with those monikers, but she's basically saying that homosexuality is all right, that transgenderism is all right, men dressing like women, women dressing like men. And she also goes on, and just, I mean, lets the, lets the cuss words fly and goes on to advocate for a whole bunch of things that Dr. King himself would have never approved of. I mean, you're looking at Dr. King, even though there were probably some things that I disagreed with him on, for example, his economic policies, I think were a little off. You're looking at his stance on civil rights and the stances that he took when it came to his Christianity, his faith. This was a guy that really strongly believed that we were supposed to be following the Bible as God intended it, as Jesus intended it, and, and as it was written. Not all this PC stuff where they rewrite stuff. Where they say, well, everybody's acceptable and you don't really have to repent of any of your sins. And as long as you, uh, actually, she wasn't saying whether you love Jesus or not, it's fine. It just doesn't matter what you believe. Dr. King would have never advocated for such a ridiculous stance. So I want you to, to think about this. Out of these two marches, which crowd do you believe Dr. King would have been more at home with? In other words, which crowd would he, would he more easily fit into? I'm not saying agreed with everything. I'm saying which one do you think that he would have been more likely to attend? Which group would he have felt more comfortable with and, and more like it was his own people around him? I really do want you to think about this when we're talking about this. Because Dr. Martin Luther King said, and this is a quote, so don't freak out on me, YouTube. Don't demonetize this video. I'm quoting Dr. King when I say this. The Negro cannot win if he is willing to sacrifice the futures of his children for immediate personal comfort and safety. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So Dr. King saying right there that if you are willing to sacrifice the future of your children for personal comfort and safety, then you are a bad person. He's condemning that action. And yet that's exactly what abortions are. They're saying, well, you know, having children is inconvenient and I didn't want a child, therefore I got an abortion. You know, that doesn't justify it. You're sacrificing the future of your child for your own comfort. They're saying, well, what about instances of life of the mother? So you're sacrificing the future of your children for your own safety. This goes right along with all the abortions arguments and flies in the face of them. Dr. King would have not been in favor of abortion. Now, granted, he didn't talk a lot on the subject because he lived in a time where it was illegal and it wasn't really a hot button political issue. But you have Dr. King here saying that anybody that would be doing that, he says they cannot win if they are willing to sacrifice the future of their children for comfort and safety. And you also have his niece, Alveda King, saying this, and this is a, a little bit longer, but this is an interview that took place yesterday. Dr. Alveda King, and she's one of the ones that actually led the closing prayer at the March for Life. She said this in a, a Daily Signal interview. Well, what has happened with my uncle's legacy? They forget the spiritual aspect. 
and so was one who civil, uh, who's also a civil rights leader for the 20th century and now the 21st century. I was there, and I marched, and I went to jail with those great leaders. I was a young lady, a teenage girl. However, I remember the prayer meetings and how often we came together and prayed. I remember that everything we did was founded on the Bible. One of my favorite songs was Paul and Silas were bound in jail, had no money to pay their bail. Keep your eye on the prize. Hold on. Of course, the prize was the love of God toward all people and the salvation of humanity. I believe that we have not given full credence to the spiritual aspect of the message of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., her words, not mine, which includes the sanctity of life, procreative message, a man and woman marrying with commitment, if God wills, to birth and raise children in a healthy manner, taking care of the least of these. All right, so you're looking at that quote. This is someone who was there on the ground when Dr. King was alive, during the movement, was a teenager at that time, saying that the whole thing was rooted in spirituality and that people have forgotten that. That people have completely ignored the fact that Dr. King was also a preacher, was also a spiritual leader. You see, now, today, most people just think of him as being a, a political activist. And he was. He was a political activist. Nobody would deny that. But he was also a spiritual leader. In fact, he was first and foremost a spiritual leader. And it takes both to really understand the man. You have to understand his political activism and his spirituality because his political activism came as an outgrowth of his spiritual beliefs. People act like it was the other way around, that he was using religion as a way to talk to people about political activism. No, no, no. It started as a spiritual movement and delved into the realm of politics where it was appropriate. See, the rights of human beings, the rights that are associated with being a human being are true whether you're black, whether you're white, whether you're Asian or Hispanic or an unborn person. And that's the thing. The whole argument for being against abortion being pro-life is that all human life is inherently valuable, which is the same premise that Alveda King is saying started the civil rights movement. The idea that we have a responsibility as creations of God to stand up for other people that are not able to stand up for themselves and are having their rights violated, the rights that were given to them by God, that we're not treating our brothers and sisters the way that we're supposed to. That's the argument that King was making back then, and it's the argument that the pro-life people are making now. And that's the correlation that Dr. King, and when I say that I mean Dr. Alveda King, is seeing between that civil rights movement, which she was a part of, and the civil rights movement now of abortion and fighting against that great evil. Now, here's another thing I want you to consider. If you're going back to Dr. King and you know anything about history, to be in his group, you had to sign an oath. You had to sign an oath just to be able to participate in protest with his group. And I'm going to read you, because there were 10 planks, and I'm going to read you a part of it. I hereby pledge myself, my person and body, to the nonviolent movement. Therefore, I will keep following the Ten Commandments. One, meditate daily on the teachings and life of Jesus Christ. That's number one. In other words, you cannot be a member of Dr. King's group back in the 1960s unless the very first thing that you agree to is I am going to meditate daily on the teachings and the life of Jesus. Think about how significant that is. If you're not somebody that reads the scripture and thinks about it and contemplates that, you're not allowed to even be part of our group. Let's look at plank number three. Walk and talk in the manner of love, for God is love. So, because God is love, we're supposed to talk and walk in the manner of love in everything that we do. All right, let's look at number four. Pray daily to be used by God in order that all men might be free. So, unless you pray to God on a daily basis, 
to be a part of God's will that everybody would be free. So unless you believe that your goal is God-oriented, that it is God or has ordained this, the thing that you're fighting for, the freedom of all mankind, is something that God specifically wants to be in place. And unless you're praying to him daily to help out with that, then you're also not allowed to be in Dr. King's group. And let's skip down to number nine. Strive to be in good spiritual and bodily health. So in other words, you have to be worried about how your spirit is doing, how your spiritual health is, if you're going to be a part of this group. And you had to take this oath. Every single person that was a member of his group had to take it. And by the way, the name of that movement was the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. If the left saw this today, they'd say, this man's a religious zealot. He's a bigot. He doesn't want people that aren't Christians and don't believe the things that he believes as a member of his group. In fact, the Democrats were the ones that were opposing Dr. King back in the 1960s. But what I'm saying here is, if you were looking at this pledge today, there would be Democrats that are saying, this guy's some religious fanatic. Everything he does is based in the scripture. And unless you're a Christian, you're not even allowed to be part of his group. Yeah, that's who Dr. King was. That's how seriously he took it. And so this idea that he was not a spiritual leader and to ignore that aspect of his life is being completely disingenuous to his legacy. And if you don't believe me when I say that this is how they would go after Dr. Martin Luther King today, look at how the left just reacted to Karen Pence. For Karen Pence signing a pledge saying that she will subscribe to the biblical view of uh, morality, sexuality, marriage, all these things. I mean, that was the part that they focused on, but it's just sort of a general pledge that you will uphold Christian principles. They're saying that she's a religious bigot and that her husband should not be allowed to continue to be the vice president because of this. Yeah, well, Dr. King made people take essentially exactly the same oath. The same thing. So if you don't believe me when I say that the left would have gone after Dr. King for his religion today, then you're not paying attention. Because they did the same thing to Karen Pence. They did the same thing to Mike Pence, her husband. And they're saying because she signed an oath saying that she was a Christian and she believed these things, that she's somebody that should be cast out of polite society. They would have done the same thing to Dr. King. The exact same thing. Because to Dr. King, there was nothing more important than making sure that his movement was based in the scripture, based in the Bible, and the principles that it taught. I think when you look at that evidence that I've just presented, there is absolutely no doubt that if you're looking at the two and you have to make a comparison and you make a call, there's no doubt in my mind whatsoever that Dr. King would have been far more at ease and far more at home in the March for Life than he would have been anywhere near the Women's March. Speaking of that, we're actually going to go to a call right now. We've got John from Millbrook on line one. Good morning. Good morning. Earlier, we were talking about Dr. King and mindset that he would have today. It's sure. basically what you were saying, because you were saying which group that he'd be allied with. Right. First of all, as far as his personality, and if you go back and research him, and that's one of the problems that we have today, uh, he's held up as an icon, but people don't know anything about the man. They don't act like, but he was a person that believed that God's word was in the inspired word. Mm-hmm. He believed in the sanctity of life. He believed that the the Bible was his best friend in the civil rights movement. And it was. But And it was. Uh, that's how he was able to gain fit. The, the civil rights movement started in Bible-believing churches. Yeah. That was, his, that was the origin of the whole civil rights movement. All you have to do is study it just a little bit, and you'll see that. The power was from the pulpits mm-hmm. and from those that were attendees of the, not just the Baptist congregations, of which he was a minister and had a doctorate in theology from. Mm-hmm. And, you know, people in, in our modern world today, among the progressives, think that he would be right in there with Louis Farrakhan. <laughs> or he'd be right in, I mean, some sure. No, I, I know. With, with people that are... Wait, well, now you're breaking up there a little bit. You there? Hello? Hello? 
Well, I'm afraid we've lost John. It doesn't sound like we're going to be able to get him back. Sorry about that. But uh, no, great points and, and all, I think, well-founded. I just, uh, I hate that uh, we lost you there. But no, he's right that the whole movement was based in Scripture. It was based around spirituality. You just heard Alveda King talking about how the prayer movements, that's what kept them centered. Because if you are a group of people that is being persecuted against, uh, being persecuted against unjustly, you're right. The Bible is your best friend. It gives you the blueprint on how to act on that. You can look at the persecution of Israelites in the Old Testament. You can look at the persecution of Christians in the New Testament, especially, for example, the book of Revelation. It tells you how to deal with things like that. Because it predicted that that was going to happen. You see it in examples and narratives, and you see it put out in actual instructions in the epistles. This was something that Christians were dealing with. This is something that Israelites were dealing with. And so because of that, it just makes perfect sense to use the Bible as your template, your guide, when going through something like that. Because unless you have a strong belief system and a faith in something greater than yourself, you don't just stand down and continue to be nonviolent when you have people literally turning fire hoses and dogs on you just for marching in the streets. I mean, when that happens, you've got to have a strong faith. When you have people in the night stealing away black people and lynching them to make an example out of them, you have to have a strong faith to be able to continue on in the face of that adversity. And Dr. King understood that. And that's the reason that he based everything he did around the Bible. And that's the reason that his was successful, and you had other radicals like Malcolm X that weren't. You had other radical movements before him that had failed, because they weren't based in the scripture, they weren't based in morality. It was just anger and vengeance. Dr. King came out and said, well, the Bible says we should seek reconciliation, not vengeance. We should treat these people as brothers that have lost their way, not inhuman monsters, even though some of them acted pretty inhuman from time to time. And Dr. King saw the Bible and saw the scripture and saw what was being talked about there and believed that that really was the way to make sure that his movement was rooted in the truth. And it looks like we have another caller on. I don't know if that's John from Millbrook trying to get back, but uh, we have somebody else on. Good morning. What's your name? Yeah, it's me. I'm, I'm okay. back. I'm sorry I got cut off earlier, but I, I don't know what you heard, but the the last thing I talked about was the center of his movement was the church. Right. And the center of his, his movement, really the movement all over the country was in African-American congregations all over, and that was the way that he gained uh, a lot of white support, too. Right. Because it was biblical. And that's why that covers it. Uh, and it of course, there are a lot of people that well, that, that, that that's abuse an, it the other way. But, that, you know. Well, that that's an well, sure, but that's an appeal that works because if you're standing before somebody that believes that they are in the right, believes that they are doing the right thing, and believes that they're following God, and then Dr. King is pointing to Scripture and saying, "No, no, the Bible says this is wrong," that becomes a lot more compelling. And so the fact that he did base it in Scripture and he based it off of the persecution of Christians and the persecution of the Israelites, and you can hear him talk about that and talk about the similarities between the two movements over and over again, because he had it all based around this idea of, of Scripture, that's the reason that his movement was able to be very successful and other movements that weren't based in the Scripture weren't, because they were all about vengeance. Dr. King just wanted reconciliation. He just wanted to be a part of the society. He didn't want to be given special treatment. He didn't want to strike back at other people and lash out and take vengeance. He just wanted everybody to come together. And that's the reason his movement was successful where others failed. That's true. And, you know, it was one of those things, too, before he died, he mm -hmm. lost a lot of his influence with people because he was wanting to move faster in another direction with violence, in fact. Yep. And I, I think if he had lived a lengthy life, uh, the thing would have turned out much differently as far as his influence. He had to be a martyr to be the symbol. You know, it, it's a shame. <laughs> it, it, it's it's always hard to to get into that guessing game because you don't you don't really know how that would have played out. But I I think that it's a plausible theory, yeah. and 
you know, you hate to, to hear that, but maybe it was part of God's plan that he became a martyr. I don't know. Uh, that'll be something I'll have to, to ask one day when I <laughs> when I actually to, do get to the pearly gates. That'll be a question I'll have to ask then. But uh, anyway, I, thank you. Both, I bet both arms and both legs, though, that he was pro-life. Oh, I don't think there's any doubt about that. If you, I, I don't know if you heard it or not, but all the quotes that I was reading, both from his niece and from him directly, sure. I mean, there, there's no question about that in my mind. Sure. Anyway. Well, take care. All right. Yeah, you too. Thank you. But that being that being said, we are going to actually go to the Daily Dose of Stupid. I know that a lot of people were expecting me to go to the Covington Boys. We've already been going for a long time. We've already done a lot of talking I'm going to save that for tomorrow for a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, I just don't have the time right now. And second of all, and I think this is most important, I want to get it right. And I have been perusing through literally hours upon hours of video trying to sort everything out and make sure that I get every detail of the story correct because there has been an abundance of misinformation in this particular story. And so because of that, I want to make sure that I get all the details right, that I have my timeline right and everything else. And so because of that, even though I had some stuff that I prepared to talk about today, I'm actually going to hold off and bring that to you tomorrow. So that'll be something to look forward to tomorrow. In the meantime, I think it's time that we go to the daily dose of stupid. That was stupid. I know it was stupid. Really stupid. Hey, I just said it was stupid. All right, so today's Daily Dose of Stupid. I'm going to have to start renaming this thing the Daily Dose of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez because she just seems to be in the middle of everything all the time, and she's usually the dumbest one in the room. Uh, and I, I say that jeeringly. She is my favorite House representative now. I like her far more than any of the others, even the, the conservative ones like uh, Gary Palmer and Mo Brooks. I got to say... AOC has got to be my favorite one at this point, not because of her voting record, but because she makes my job easier. So let's go ahead and go to one clip. This is from uh, a Martin Luther King Day event that she was doing where she was talking about this and talking about global warming. So go ahead. And I think that the part of it that is generational is that millennials and people and you know gen z and all these folks that come after us are looking up and we're like the world is going to end in 12 years if we don't address climate change and your biggest issue is your your biggest issue is how are we going to pay for it and like this is the war this is our world war ii and I, I I can't even process that. So there you have, and I know that the sound was a little bit low, and I apologize for that, but Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez sitting there, serious as a heart attack, saying the world is going to end in 12 years. Like, 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 like the world is, is like going to end in like, like 12 years, and you're like worried about how to like pay for it and stuff? I don't see how anyone ever took this woman seriously. She doesn't come off as a serious person when she's talking about these things, but there she is, completely dead face serious, saying that the world is going to end in 12 years. But, you know, even though she has a tendency for gaffes and she's kind of known for saying dumb things or overplaying things, it's not as though this is an Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez only problem. Let's rewind, because... I'm old enough to remember, and I'm the same age as Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. I'm old enough to remember when Al Gore, in An Inconvenient Truth back in 2006, said that in 10 years, we will be past the point of no return when it comes to global warming. Yeah, in 2006! So 10 years after that would have been 2016. It's currently 2019. We've kind of moseyed on past that point. And yet, Al Gore is still out there saying that we need to change things or, or now we're going to be past the point of no return. And see, that's the thing. They keep giving these outrageous, outlandish claims that unless we do everything that they say right now and basically turn over our lives to stopping global warming, then the world's just going to end in a decade. 
and it never happens. We never come even close to doing the things that they suggest that we have to do. And yet the world still keeps going on. In fact, if you're looking at global warming, not really any different than it was back in 2006. In fact, we had an 18 year pause when it came to global time, uh, climate uh, temperatures going up, if you're looking at the oceanic view. So if you're looking at ocean temperatures, which is a, a much more accurate way of measuring global temperature because it's not usually affected by environmental factors quite as much. For example, you can't have a thermostat on top of a blacktop in the middle of the ocean, or you can't have a thermostat in a particularly sunny area that just happens to be experiencing more heat than normal when you're looking at ocean temperatures. And so if you're looking at that, we had a 15 to 18 year pause in the rise of global climate, in the rise of global temperatures. And so you're looking at this person saying that in 12 years, the world's just going to be gone. There's going to be no more world if we don't do something to stop it. Well, if we're that close to the end, I doubt there's really anything that we could do to stop it at this point anyway. But nonetheless, uh, one of the things that I thought was really insane is that she said that this is our generation's World War II. All right. You know I'm a stats and numbers guy. Let's do a statistical comparison. World War II killed 72 million people. And that's on both sides. Six million alone just in the Holocaust. But if you're looking at it worldwide, looking at the problem and the scope of it, 72 million people, which was roughly 3 to 5% of the world's population back then. I mean, you're talking about a massive chunk of the world's population just snuffed out by World War II. Let's compare that to global warming. As of now, the, num the death toll with global warming is zero. None. Not a single life lost on account of global warming. Not a single person even injured because of global warming. And yet, somehow, that's our World War II. That global warming is just as dangerous as the Nazis. And by the way, what's hilarious about this is that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is a self-proclaimed socialist. The Nazis is short for National Socialist Workers' Party of Germany. That's who the Nazis were. And so she may have a, a different flavor of the same ice cream, but it's still ice cream. She says democratic socialism, which is really just, you know, a, a hair away from national socialism anyway. All the basic policies are still in place. The only difference is who the policy should benefit. That's the only difference they have. But nonetheless, she's saying that the Nazis were as big a concern as global warming and yet continues to be a socialist. How does that make any sense? And she's saying that that is our World War II. Well, if so... It's doing a really terrible job at killing as many people as World War II did. 72 million deaths versus zero deaths. Yeah, I'm going to say that World War II was a much bigger priority to the greatest generation than global warming is to us. And I want you to also to point this out to you. This is a woman who is constantly going on the different cable shows, and we're actually going to show a clip of that in a second, talking about immigration. And there are 15,000 Americans that are either assaulted, killed, or raped by illegal immigration. 15,000 in the past couple of years. And yet, that's a manufactured crisis. That's something we ought not worry about. That's something that, oh, that's just Donald Trump fear-mongering. And yet, global warming has killed no people. And we're supposed to just throw all of our money into that because you can't just worry about like how you're going to pay for it. So you have to throw all your money at that problem, even though it's killed no people. And we're not supposed to give $5.7 billion to build a border wall to help stave off the problems at the border. How does anyone even get to a worldview that screwed up? How does anyone even get to a worldview where 15,000 Americans being assaulted or killed or raped, not a crisis. But the fact that the temperature might grow up in just a little bit is going to cause the world to end in 12 years, and that's a crisis that we need to throw absolutely everything at and just ignore it. That should be given a blank check, but the one that's actually causing deaths and actually causing trauma and human tragedy, that one should be ignored completely. 
That one we should not even worry about. I just don't understand how she got to that point. Even the people that wrote the Paris Climate Accords, the ones that are super concerned about global warming, their estimate was that if you engaged in the Paris Climate Accords and were able to do all of the policies included in them, that that's going to make a 0.4% degree Celsius increase. That's going to keep that increase from happening by the year 2116. So within a hundred years, the climate change people, the ones that thought that it was important enough to spend billions of dollars on the Paris Climate Accords for each country, their scientists are saying, if we do this in a hundred years, the difference that it will make is that 0.4% degrees Celsius, that increase will not come to pass. Well, then where is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez getting the world's going to end in 12 years? Because 0.4 degrees Celsius does not, to me, sound like a cataclysmic event, and that's not supposed to happen for another 100 years. So I don't know where she's getting this idea that in 12 years the world's just going to be gone. I guess maybe she was watching An Inconvenient Truth and thought it was a recent release. I don't know. But um, it astounds me that she doesn't even know that because, again, I'm 29 and she's also 29. We're the same age, born in the same year. And I, I don't really understand where that's coming from. But let's just take the ridiculousness of her analogy and play it out. Let's just pretend as though the world actually was ending in 12 years. Let's say there actually was a universally agreed upon cataclysmic extinction level event that was going to take place. Let's say that there was an asteroid coming and we knew that it was going to hit in about 12 years and it was the size of the moon. So, I mean, it's basically just going to wipe out the entire planet. Even if we knew that to be the case, even if we knew that was the case, is how you're going to pay for it still a ridiculous question? Because, of course, that becomes a priority. Of course, that becomes something important that we all have to worry about. But if we wind up wrecking the economic system of every single economy in the world to do so, then wouldn't that be a big problem? Shouldn't there be some concerns about that? And shouldn't there be people asking some questions about, you think there might be a better way to do this, a way that doesn't wreck the economy of every single country on this planet? And another thing, when you're talking about a policy that is so ridiculously expensive that it's going to cost roughly the entire budget of the entire world, because remember, her policies, according to Vox.com, not exactly a right-leaning news site, we're saying that about $42 trillion is going to be what it would cost over 10 years. There's only about $50 trillion on Earth if you're adding up all the currency. And so you're talking about something that would eat up that much. Shouldn't there be somebody that says, uh, do you think maybe there's at least a cheaper way to do this? Do you think maybe we could wait until better technology comes out and then kind of work on solving that problem? To build a giant laser to destroy the asteroid or whatever? Are you saying that cost just shouldn't play into it whatsoever and you should never ask questions about cost, even if it's universally agreed upon? Even in that scenario, the cost is an important thing to think about. And so the only thing that this is really going back to is she's pitching a hissy fit that her stupid liberal policies are going to cost so much that it would be impossible to pay for them. And she's upset that people keep asking her, well, how do you pay for it? How are you going to make this work financially? She just doesn't want to answer the question, and because of that, she's angry, and she's trying to find an out. That's really all it boils down to. But that plays out even more in the second clip by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Let's go ahead and play that one. And I think that the part of it that is and no one should feel unsafe in the United States of America. And that includes our, our amazing and beautiful and productive immigrant community. And moreover, the one thing that the president has not talked about is the fact that he has systematically engaged in the violation of international human rights borders on uh, human rights on our border. He has separated children from their families. He talked about
about what happened the day after Christmas. On the day of Christmas, a child died in ICE custody. The president should not be asking for more money to an agency that has systematically violated human rights. The president should be really defending why we are funding such an agency at all. Because right now, what we are seeing is death. Right now, what we are seeing is the violation of human rights. So quite a few things to get into on that. But first of all, the main thing, she, again, makes the mistake that most people on the left make when they're talking about this is nobody's against legal immigration. I can't think of a single prominent conservative that is against legal immigration, people that want to come here from other countries. Now, there are some crazy people on the alt-right, and by the way, also some crazy people on the left, that want to shut down immigration altogether. There are a handful of radicals that nobody really pays attention to that don't like legal immigration either. But the vast overwhelming majority of people in the Republican Party and people that are conservatives, in fact, nobody that's not a conservative believes this that I'm aware of, all the prominent voices, all the elected officials, all of us are in favor of legal immigration. All of us. I have yet to talk to somebody that is against legal immigration. In fact, I've told people time and time again, frankly, there's a lot of legal immigrants that I like better than people that were born here. And so she's like, our, our amazing immigration uh, community. Yeah, well, nobody's against them. Nobody has a problem with them. The only thing you have a problem with is people that slip across the border in the dead of night and try to live off the American taxpayer, despite having done nothing to justify that, despite having not gone through the legal process and the vetting process to be able to be added to this country in a legal manner. Those people I'm fine with. It's the other people I've got an issue with. And again, like most liberals, she conflates these two things and does not is not, for whatever reason, able to separate legal from illegal immigration. Now, when you're talking about the, the jeers that she takes, virtually everything she says is completely wrong. First of all, there is no violation of the UN's human rights immigration recommendations. None. And if there are, then Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez needs to actually do her homework and show them to us. She needs to go through these guidelines and find specifically where that violation is taking place. Because if you're going to make a claim, you need to back it up. If you're going to say something is happening, then you need to back it up with research. She doesn't. She just throws claims out there. She could claim anything. She could claim that Donald Trump is secretly a Satan worshiper. But if you got no evidence to prove it, you're going to kind of have to need to provide that for me for me to take you seriously. And so, again, she just throws out all these wild claims that have absolutely no basis in fact and no evidence to back them up. And when it talks about the actual policies, when it comes to the UN and how they say that these people should be taken care of, did you know this, that refugees are still being accepted? In the United States, that never stopped. Nor did Donald Trump ever try to stop it. The refugees are still being accepted. Every single one of them. If you come in, you claim asylum, they look at your case and they judge that, yeah, actually you are a legitimate asylum seeker. They're still letting people in. And here's the irony in all of that. If you're talking about refugees that are coming from South America, Guatemala, Honduras, Venezuela, all those other places, they're actually the ones. The immigrants themselves are the ones that are not following the UN's guidelines. Because according to the UN's guidelines, because I actually did do my research, you're supposed to seek refuge in the nearest safe country. In other words, once you enter a country in which you feel safe and that you are no longer in danger of the danger in the previous country, you're supposed to seek asylum there. That actually is a part of the UN's recommendation. It's not the system to where you leave the country that you are fearing for your life. And there are people that have legitimate concerns with that. And I understand that. I'm, I'm not saying that that's not true. I'm just saying that there are a lot of people claiming that they're asylum seekers that really aren't. Um, but when people come into a, the next safest country, they're supposed to go ahead and seek refugee status there. So for example, if you are a, a Christian that is living in the middle East at the time where ISIS controlled a lot of land and you move from one country to another, but ISIS still controls that country, 
okay, well there the danger is still present. And so you just move on to the next country. And as soon as you're in territory where that threat is no longer a problem, then you're supposed to seek asylum in that country, not in other countries. It's not the system to where as long as you're a refugee, you just get to go out and shop and pick and choose which country you're going to be a part of. Uh, well, uh, I'm a refugee. I'm afraid for my life. I'm going to go there. I'd really like to see England. I love England. Uh, it seems like a nice country. I'm going to go and, and get a ship ride there. That's not how this works. You don't get to shop around for the country that you seek asylum in. That's not how that system works. So according to the UN's own guidelines, actually it's the immigrants that are coming from South America and seek a, a asylum in the United States that are violating those guidelines. And yet America, despite that, is still looking at their cases and trying to grant them asylum. And so actually, not only is the Trump administration not violating those guidelines, they're going above and beyond what those guidelines would compel them to do. And even if you didn't believe that, you still have to keep in mind, they're not law. The U.S. is still a sovereign nation. The United States does not have to agree to or sign on to any of those agreements. We're still a sovereign country. But even if you're looking at the guidelines, America is still going above and beyond what they are being asked to do. And even many on the left, when she talks about the child dying in ICE custody, even a lot of people on the left are now saying, yeah, that, that really wasn't ICE's fault. We jumped the gun on that story. Because if you're looking at it, it's really the father's fault for bringing her on this arduous journey. And the ICE people did everything in the humanly possible to be able to save this kid. They even airlifted her to a children's hospital. And it was the father that was denying medical service. He was the one that's saying, no, 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 they, they don't, she doesn't need to go back into, into the hospital. And so when you're talking about that, again, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez gets it completely backwards. And then she goes after disparaging ICE agents and says, that it basically makes this case that as though they're like some kind of cold-blooded monsters, that like they want kids to die. And she's saying that there are human rights violations going on by ICE. I mean, that's despicable. If there are law enforcement agents that are bad, whether it's local cops, whether it's FBI, yeah, they need to be dealt with. But she's saying that the entire agency is engaged in human rights violations. Where's the proof of that? Again, you can make claims, but you have to actually back them up if you want to be taken seriously. What human rights have the ICE agents been violating? Where? Where? So the fact that she goes after an entire agency of this is just despicable. And here's the funny thing. This is really the cherry on top of this whole big thing. She's talking about how Donald Trump should be justifying giving any money to ICE. She's forgetting that she voted to fund ICE. Back on January 3rd, it was in something called the House Joint Resolution 1. So back when that came up for a vote, and that bill, by the way, does fund ICE until the end of the year, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez cast her vote in favor of it. She voted to fund ICE. So she can waggle her finger all she wants, but she was actually a party to that decision to fund ICE. I mean, how this person ever got elected or taken seriously in an election is just absolutely beyond me. Let's go ahead and go to the chaplain's report. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Now, our chaplain's report today continues in our series on Daniel. And just to provide a little bit of context, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego at this point have refused to worship the idols. You remember that we've talked about that, that they were told that you're going to worship the idol of gold whenever the music plays. And they essentially looked at the king and said, no, no, we're not going to do that. And then the king gives them a second chance. And they say, nope, we're still not going to worship the idols. And so the king gets very angry about this, King Nebuchadnezzar, and he is ready to throw them into the furnace at this point. 
And the way that the Bible describes it, it's that the king was especially angry. And I think the reason that he gets so hot under the collar, pun intended, when it comes to these particular men saying that they're not going to worship is these are guys that are his advisors. These are people that specifically he had essentially picked out from the crowd to be his advisors because of Daniel and because of the dream interpretation. And so these are guys with a lot of pull and these are guys that the king has been pretty good to. And so because of that, I think he's even more uh, frustrated that these are the three men that he's been really good to that are refusing to worship the idol that he's commanding them to. And so because of that, the king gets incredibly furious and gets to the point to where he's saying, you know what, bind them, have them tied up and throw them in the furnace and make the furnace seven times hotter than I originally ordered it to be. And so his men get together and they make the furnace seven times hotter than it originally was, which honestly doesn't really make sense. And Nebuchadnezzar is not exactly the most rational guy in the world. So I guess that's fair. But uh, if you're wanting to torture someone or make it more painful, actually less heat would be the worst way to go because then you're going to burn slower. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, that is the plan that Nebuchadnezzar has. He is so furious with these guys that he wants to make the furnace seven times hotter. And this thing gets so hot that the way that the Bible describes it is the men that threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the furnace actually burned up. The flames were so intense that just by these guys, by merit of getting near enough to it, they were consumed by the fire as they threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the furnace. So this is a very, very hot furnace. And yet, we're going to see how this plays out in the, the biblical narrative. Let's look at uh, Daniel 3, 24 through 27. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded and stood up in haste and said to his officials, was there not, uh, was it not three men that, uh, th sorry, not three men were cast bound into the midst of the fire. They replied to the king, certainly, O king. And he said, look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm. And they are the, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came to the, uh, near to the door of the furnace of the blazing fire. And he responded and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out, you servants of the Most High God, and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire. The satraps, uh, the satraps and the perfects and the governors of the king's high officials gathered around and saw in regard to these men that the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men. Of, of these men, nor was their hair of their head that was singed nor of their trousers damaged, nor had the smell of fire even come upon them. So we're seeing in these scriptures that if you're these four men that are cast into the furnace, keep in mind they are bound when they're cast into the furnace, and yet their, bound, their bonds are no longer on them. They're not Houdini. They didn't escape them from them naturally. So we can only assume one thing. The bonds burned off of them. And yet their clothes are fine and their bodies are so unharmed that they don't even smell like fire. So God has such mastery, and this shouldn't surprise any of us that believe, but God has such mastery over the natural elements of this world that he was able to make the fire burn the bonds off of them without hurting them. That is an amazing miracle in and of itself, even if you don't count the fact that they just literally walked through a burning furnace completely unharmed. And one thing that is important to note, too, is that there was a fourth person in there with them. Now, there's a little bit of, I guess, religious uh, back and forth on this. If you're looking at the way that the text reads, it's clear that what Nebuchadnezzar was talking about when he says that the fourth man is like a son of the gods. He's talking about some kind of supernatural being. In other words, the fourth person in there has an, a different appearance than all of the others. And because of that, because of the verbiage that is used there, the son of God, a lot of people speculate that that means Christ. Now that's not completely implausible. I guess it's certainly possible that Jesus Christ could have been the one that descended 
and save Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the furnace, but I don't think that that's what the scripture is actually saying. Keep in mind that Nebuchadnezzar is a pagan, and so in his own mind, what he's seeing is some supernatural being. Well, it must be someone who's a, a demigod or a son of the gods or something like that. And so that's what Nebuchadnezzar is actually saying, because he wouldn't have known who Christ was to begin with. So even if he believed it was, quote-unquote, the Son of God, how would he have known the difference? So I do think that people make a little bit of an error, even though well-intended, well when reading this passage and reading into that and saying that that must be Christ. It's probably more likely an angel. We see an angel is actually the one that closes up the lion's mouth a little bit later in Daniel. And so it kind of makes sense that it would have probably been an angel that was saying to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's needs and keeping them safe in the furnace, not necessarily Jesus Christ himself. That just seems to me to be the more logical, the more plausible explanation for what is going on here. But nonetheless, God does provide for them and God does take care of what they're doing there. And because of that, King Nebuchadnezzar has to acknowledge God's superiority. He has to acknowledge because he's he's looking in and he's seeing this. He's looking directly at it and he's saying, okay, it's clear. The pagan idol that I was worshiping, that doesn't really have any power because you refused to worship it and yet your God was able to save you from the consequences of not worshiping. Clearly their God is the superior one. Now, of course, we know that there are no other gods. But in his mind, this was a competition of the gods. If their God to deliver him from the wrath of his God, then that meant that their God was superior. And that's why he refers to it as the Most High God. So by this great act of faith, King Nebuchadnezzar does see yet again that God in his power and his might is being with these people. That their behavior is ordained by him, that they're following his word, his commands, that they are servants of, as Nebuchadnezzar calls it, the Most High. And so because of that, he has to acknowledge God's superiority and I think acknowledge that these guys actually do know what they're talking about when they talk about God. And because of that, Nebuchadnezzar now at least has a basis for his own faith. Now whether or not he follows it or not, we're going to see that there's some struggles with that later on. But the truth is, these people being in the midst of, of this large group of people that are not Jews, they're getting to see God's power firsthand in a way that they normally would not be able to. And that really is a blessing to them. And with faith, I think that the message that we can take from this is that not only can you walk through fire, but you can be freed from your bonds because of it. That even trials that we look at that we think are going to be horrible, that are going to be just the worst for us, actually turn out making us into better people. Because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, don't you think that their faith was strengthened because of this? And I think there's a fair bit of symbolism in this as well. That sometimes going through a struggle, sometimes going through a trial of fire, is the only way to really set yourself free. Because God has the power to burn off your bonds without hurting you. And the only way to be able to do that is to have faith in him, that he's going to be able to deliver you from whatever circumstance you have. You have to believe that your God is bigger than the circumstances surrounding you. And that's certainly what these three men believed. Stay the course, friends.